Hello, and welcome to the lecture accompanying Chapter 6 on the topic of momentum from Hewitt, Conceptual Physics, 12th edition. All right, so let's see what we're going to be covering in this chapter. So we're going to talk about momentum, its definition, define something called impulse, relate impulse to changes in momentum, which is a very direct relationship, talk about how bouncing is a form of momentum change, then discuss when momentum is conserved, when we expect it to be, and how that can lead to the understanding of collisions, and finally, a brief note about more complicated collisions. All right, so let's get into defining momentum. Okay, so momentum is a property of moving things, okay? We'll see that that's similar to another topic that we'll discuss in the next chapter called kinetic energy, although they are certainly not the same, okay? It means inertia in motion, okay? Now be careful with that definition because I don't want you to think that it means inertia. It means inertia in motion. In other words, momentum definitely does not have the same units as inertia. Okay, inertia does not equal momentum. They are not two words for the same thing. So, specifically, it is the mass of an object multiplied by its velocity. Momentum is mass times velocity. And remember, mass is a synonym of inertia. Thus, the units of momentum, which we often represent as the letter P, don't ask me why, always lowercase, is mv. m for mass, v for velocity. Okay? And that would be, not the units, excuse me, but the symbolic expression. Unit-wise, well, what is it? It would be kilogram meters per second. Okay? Do note that here the M stands for mass, here the M stands for meters. Because one is a variable, a symbolic expression, that's the, the mass, and the M inside the parentheses is a unit, it is the meter, the standard unit of length. So anyway, another common way of expressing momentum in terms of units is Newton seconds. And that's because a Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. So kilogram meter per second squared, that comes from Newton's second law, mass times acceleration. Notice the square time in the denominator. And if we multiply by seconds, look what happens. We cancel out one of the seconds of the denominator with the seconds that comes from our Newton second expression, and we get right back to the kilogram meters per second that I presented as the initial units momentum. So it's up to you whether you want to express it all in terms of base units in the box or more derived units, which I prefer. So moving right along. So example, a moving boulder has more momentum than a stone rolling at the same speed because bigger mass. Okay. So you can get more momentum just by making your mass bigger, your M bigger. On the other hand, a fast boulder has more momentum than a slow boulder. Bigger velocity, bigger V. A boulder at rest has no momentum, even though it has inertia. Okay, so you can have inertia, but no momentum. That's because inertia refers to the sluggishness of matter, and it will be hard to start that object moving. But if it's not moving, by definition, it does not have momentum because you'd be multiplying by a velocity of zero and anything times zero would be zero. So a moving object has what? Momentum, energy, speed, or all of the above. Okay, feel good about your answer? All of the above, okay? And we'll talk about energy, which I've hinted at now. This is the second time I've hinted at it in the next chapter. When the speed of an object is doubled, its momentum, make sure you got this one, look at the formula. We call it a direct proportionality, which means it also doubles. So what is impulse? Impulse is a product of force and time. Okay, so impulse is F times T. F times T, okay? So often we write, we express impulse, not just as a word, but we use a letter for it, and it's uppercase J for impulse. So it's F times T. T for force, 
excuse me, F for force, T for time. Here's the thing. What are the units? Well, oh, wouldn't that just be Newton seconds? Does that mean, yep, impulse has the same units as momentum. Has same units as momentum. And that's because in addition to conceptually thinking about impulse as force times time, it is also the change in momentum. J for impulse equals delta for change times momentum. J for impulse also equals force times time. Okay, these are true statements either way. It's all about perspective. Is your goal to, to primarily think about what the change in momentum is, perhaps solving for the final momentum? Then you might wanna define impulse as delta P. On the other hand, if you know the force and the time and you're asked for the impulse, or perhaps you're solving for the time or the force, the force and you know the impulse, then you use the, excess, the second expression. Context is everything here. But absolutely, these two statements agree with each other, and they are furthermore restatements, reskinning of Newton's third law. So there's really not anything new here. There are just new techniques of solving things, but not new laws or physics, okay? Okay, we will have a new law, but we're not there yet. We'll wait a few slides. Examples of impulse. A brief force applied over a short time interval produces a small change in momentum, smaller change in momentum, than the same force applied over a longer time interval, okay? So that means it produces a smaller impulse. Aha, okay? Or if you push with the same force for twice the time, you impart twice the impulse and produce twice the change of momentum. See how they are both twice? That's because they are the same thing, just expressed differently. Okay? So the greater the impulse exerted on something, the greater change in its, in its momentum. Impulse defined as force multiplied by time is none other than delta mv, where mv is, of course, momentum. This is just expressing the same thing again, which I'll go ahead and rewrite, just as a reminder that Ft is by definition impulse, as is delta P, and mv is none other than P. Okay? When the force that produces an impulse acts for twice as much time, the impulse is, what type of proportionality is there between force and impulse? Yep, it's another direct one. So that's good. These are all very straightforward in that respect, aren't they? Good. Impulse changes momentum. Increasing momentum. Apply the greatest force for as long as possible and you extend the time of contact. Okay, so that would be making a bigger T. Force can vary throughout the contact. It need not be constant. Examples. Golfer swings a club and follows through. Baseball player hits a ball and follows through. Okay, continuing that contact time as opposed to a very short contact time, allows for a greater change of momentum. Thus, because the mass doesn't change during these phenomenon, a greater final velocity, which is what you want, right? For the golf ball, for the baseball. You want a greater final velocity. So you follow through, you increase the contact time. Okay, the time of contact. If you were to swing the club and abruptly stop it at the bottom of the swing and not follow through on the upswing, you would not be maximizing your time of contact. You would not be maximizing your final velocity. Okay? A cannonball shot from a cannon with a long barrel will merge with a greater speed because the cannonball receives a greater, what is it? Is it the force is greater? The impulse? Is it both? It's just the impulse. The average force is assumed to be constant, okay? Not, not, and even furthermore, we can't make an assumption one way or the other. What we can absolutely say is even if the force was to decrease towards the end of the long barrel, just the fact that the barrel is longer would mean a greater total impulse because we've extended our T, okay? We've made this one bigger. 
larger than width short barrel with no necessary change to F. Okay? Decreasing momentum over a long time. Extend the time during which momentum is reduced. Why would you want to do that? Okay? Well, safety sometimes. A fast moving car hitting a haystack or hitting a cement wall produces vastly different results. Okay? I'm just saying common sense here. All right? Okay? Do both experience the same change in momentum? Do both experience the same impulse? Do both experience the same force? Okay? Now we're going to assume that the car comes to a stop in both cases. The big haystack, comes, the car comes to rest. All right? The cement wall, car comes to rest. And the cement wall, we'll say, is so rigid that it doesn't you know, really, other than maybe a crack or two, no, no major effect to the cement wall. The haystack, we can assume, is, is basically pushed all around, maybe moves with the car. All right? You got the image? So what does that tell you about these three things? Okay? One and two, yes. Okay? Same change in momentum, same impulse. Okay? Because impulse is delta P. So that's M times V final minus M times V initial. We're assuming V final was zero, so both the haystack and the wall brought the car to rest, as I said. So that means that whole first term is zero. Thus, the change in impulse in both times is just negative M V initial. Well, that's definitely the same, right? It's the same car, so it's the same mass, and the car was driving at the same speed in both cases, so it's the same V initial. Aha, uh -huh. they have to be the same. But it's the force that is definitely not the same. Why is that? Because the other way to define impulse, that J equals F times T. T is bigger for which one? The haystack, of course. Thus, F is able to be smaller and still produce the same magnitude J. On the other hand, for the very small T in the case of the ungiving cement wall, F has to be much larger in order to compensate. And we get a very large F, and the car, car is damaged. Okay. Now, could we talk about this with Newton's third law? Absolutely. In that case, it would be acceleration. Uh-huh. And the car would have to accelerate much greater for the cement wall because the, the cement wall doesn't hardly accelerate at all. And then it's a sudden stop because it does the damage to the car. But we could also say it's the force that does the damage to the car. See? Two sides of the same coin. When the dish falls, will the change in momentum be less if it lands on a carpet than if it lands on a hard floor? <laughs> Hint. It's the same. Okay? It's not the impulse is different. It's the force that differs. All right? So here are the examples. Just the pictorial representations of our car crashing a into a haystack. Notice the haystack kind of, like I said, gets moved with the car, totally deformed. The cement wall hardly gives, other than a little bit of buckling shown here in a cartoonish way. All right? Refer back to this slide if it's still not making sense to you. Okay? Likewise, being punched, okay? Riding with the punch does less damage to your face, okay? Notice here that the size, oh, excuse me, notice here the size of the font represents big T, small f, versus big F, small t, but in both cases they're equal to the same change in momentum. Okay? So it's a fun way to represent which one's bigger, big force or, or lar longer time. Okay? Decreasing momentum over a short time, it, a short produ interval produces a large force. So before we had a decrease in momentum over a large time, safety reasons, less damage to things. Okay, better to crash into a haystack than a cement wall. Runaway trucks are better off crashing into sand and water than into the rocky side of a cliff or something, right? Well, what if you do want to do damage on the other hand? Well, now we're on the case three, okay? Example, karate expert splits a stack of bricks by bringing her arm and hand swiftly against the bricks with considerable momentum. The, kind of, the time of contact is very brief, thus the force must be huge. So the karate chop is exactly the opposite of the follow through with the golf club. It is a very quick stop, which means all the momentum of the hand ends up being equal, the chain ends up being, the change of momentum ends up being equal to force times time. And since the time is so small, the force must be large. J equals big F times very small t. Okay? That's how you can deliver so much force with a punch 
or a chop, a karate chop, that wouldn't normally break bricks if you didn't have the right technique of abruptly stopping your arm. Okay, what about bouncing? Okay, impulses are generally greater when objects bounce. An example, catching a falling flower pot from a shelf with your hands. You provide the impulse to reduce its momentum to zero. If you throw the flower pot back up again, you must provide an additional impulse. This doubles the impulse because now the change in velocity is twice as big. Okay? J in this case, which is delta P, would be MV final minus MV initial. V final is just the same as V initial in magnitude but opposite in direction. So then we have M times negative V initial minus MV initial to equal negative 2 M V initial. Whereas if we were just bringing the flower pot to stop, this first term is zero when V final is zero, and that would just be equal to negative V initial. See? Twice as much. Okay? Additional impulse. Double the impulse. There's the two. Okay? This can be applied to water wheels. A Pelton wheel is designed to push the water into these specially designed curved paddles, which forces the water coming into the paddle to make a U-turn. When the water makes a U-turn, V final equals negative V initial, and the impulse is twice as big as if the paddle was, say, just a normal square, and the water was just coming to a stop. Right? So both cases bringing the water to an abrupt stop and making it do a U-turn, definitely deliver momentum to the wheel and will push it, but making it do a U-turn pushes it twice as effectively. Twice the push. So twice the push for a Pelton water wheel. So here is our new law. Because at this point, we have been rebranding Newton's third law, introducing a new ter term called momentum, but you might wonder, what's the point? Why not stick with Newton's third law? Why not discuss everything in terms of acceleration? Sure, it's been useful to introduce force a little bit here, but we already had force because we had force pairs. Okay, so why do we care? Because momentum is pretty special. Momentum is conserved in a very convenient way for taking into account situations and solving them numerically or quantitatively. So let's talk about what conservation of momentum is. Well. Conservation as a law, conservation momentum as a law, says that in the absence of an external force, the momentum of a system remains unchanged. Okay? So that means that the final momentum equals the initial momentum. So what are situations where there's no external force? Well, that could be like this canny here. We're assuming that friction force is small. So assume the friction force is negligible. Okay? That means that it's just not there. We don't care about it. In that case, there's no external force to the system. The only force is the initial force pair between the cannonball and the cannon. Okay? And this force reaction and action are equal and opposite in direction based on Newton's third law. These two arrows are supposed to be the same length. Okay? Well, that means that there is a recoil velocity for the cannon based on mv. And there is a forward velocity of the cannonball based on mv. Okay? So this is the mass of the cannon. This is the mass of the ball. This is the velocity of the cannon, and this is the velocity of the ball. Okay? So, which is larger? The velocity of the cannon on recoil or velocity of the ball? Of course, it's the velocity of the ball, because m for the ball is smaller than m for the cannon. 
When a cannon is fired, the force on the cannonball inside the cannon barrel is equal and opposite to the force on the cannonball on the cannon. The cannonball gains momentum while the cannon gains an equal amount of momentum in the opposite direction. The cannon recoils. When no external force is present, no external impulse is present, and no change in momentum is possible. P final equals P initial. Okay? That means that if we were to measure the velocity of one of the, one of the two and knew both their masses, then we could solve for the missing velocity. Okay? Internal molecular forces within a baseball come in pairs, canceling one another out, and have no effect on the momentum of the ball. Molecular forces within a baseball have no effect on its momentum. Pushing against a car's dashboard has no effect on its momentum. Okay? For all collisions in the absence of external, external forces, the net momentum before the collision equals the net momentum after the collision. Why net? Because there may be two moving things initially. In the case of the cannon, there was zero moving things initially, okay? And afterwards, there was two moving things. But there might be two moving things initially and two moving things after the collision, okay? Think about balls crashing together. They're moving before and after the collision, okay? So in the case of the cannon, our net momentum before would have been zero because both the cannon and the cannonball were at rest before they applied equal and opposite forces to each other. Afterwards, we have mass of the cannon times velocity of the cannon minus mass of the ball times velocity of the ball. And we know that these two terms the first term, mv, and the second term, mv, have to be equal to each other because that's the only way they can be equal to zero. In other words, you could just move one to the other side. Okay? So elastic collision is a collision where energy is conserved. More about that in the next chapter. Okay? Another way to describe it is it is a type of a collision that occurs when colliding objects rebound without lasting def deformation or any generation of heat, okay? So it is a very perfect collision. An inelastic collision, on the other hand, occurs when colliding objects result in deformation and a generation of heat, and they stick together. Train cars would be a good example of that. You could imagine them coupling together with the large magnets or clipping mechanisms that hold the train cars together. That would be an inelastic collision. Train cars come together, they bump into each other, but they don't just rebound off of each other, they stick together afterwards. They remain attached. Okay, so here's an example of an elastic collision, the type without deformation or heat. A single car moving at 10 meters per second collides with another car of the same mass at rest. From the conservation of momentum, we get that the final velocity of the car is five meters per second. Okay, let's see why. Okay, so before the collision, we have m times 10. Okay, why just one turn with m times 10? Well, that's because there's only one moving object. The other car is at rest. So the other term would just be m times zero, so it doesn't show up. Afterwards, we have a net momentum, a net mv, which is gonna be two times the mass times velocity. Okay, so then they're going. So then we're going to have it, the car moving at five meters per second. Okay, a freight car A is moving towards identical freight car B that is at rest. When they collide, both freight cars couple together. That's the, they stick together. Compared with the initial speed of freight car A, the speed of the coupled freight car is. I bet you can figure this out. It's half. Okay, you can use the same logic as before. Okay, what about more complicated collisions? And I won't ask you to do any trig to solve these. We're just gonna talk about these conceptually. Sometimes the colliding objects are not moving in the same straight line. In this case, you create a parallelogram, ah, I think vectors, of the vectors describing each initial momentum to find the combined momentum. Example, collision of two cars at a corner. So we, we assume here that both cars have the same momentum Notice that momentum is being represented here as a vector. Well, that makes sense because it's just a scalar times a vector. 
mass being a scalar, velocity being a vector, a scalar times a vector is definitely a vector. It's just a lengthened vector. I guess unless m is less than a kilogram, then it's a shortened vector. But the point is that momentum is definitely a vector. Okay? So we just take these two momentums, draw a parallelogram, in this case a square, and then find the hypotenuse, which is the resultant momentum, which is just the sum, and we find out that they must move off at none other than 45 degrees because it's a square. Okay. Cool. But it would be a rectangle if either, either, one, either one of them was either faster than the other or more massive than the other. Or one could be faster and more massive, in which case it would just be a really long rectangle potentially. Okay. Here's another example of momentum co um, conservation in a more complicated sense, okay? A sense that isn't just a straight line, like the freight cars and the cars, right? The freight train and the cars. Those, that was just one dimensional, straight line. This is not, it's two dimensional. So is this one, okay? A firecracker exploding. The total momentum of the pieces after the explosion can be added vectorially to get the initial momentum of the firecracker before it exploded, okay? So there was some initial momentum in the vertical direction, mv vert, but there was no initial momentum in the horizontal direction. So p horizontal was zero. So when the firecracker explodes, whatever is all the velocities in the horizontal direction of the explo explosion must sum up, the, all the momentums must sum up to zero. So the mass is times the velocities. That would be the masses of individual fragments times the velocities of those individual fragments, one. All right, and the horizontal would have to sum up to zero. In the vertical, they'd have to sum up to whatever was the initial momentum. And that's shown here. Here's the initial vertical momentum, the only non-zero momentum of the firecracker. And then we see that these vectors here, which are meant to represent vertical, vertical components of the two fragments, they have to sum up. Okay? And their horizontal components have to cancel. These ones cancel out. All right? But the vertical components sum. Amazing, huh? Okay? And that's it for our introduction to momentum. And you'll see that this segues nicely into talking about energy because energy is also conserved. Thank you so much for watching this video on momentum. And check out the energy video later this week.